And so people now sell kits to uh, add PID. So the interesting thing is that the espresso manufacturing companies, kind of like cigar box makers, the innovation, you know, espresso machines have been around for over 100 years. The innovation curve has been flat. And then these PID guys came and just did it on their own for fun and added it. And the espresso makers ha didn't even see it coming. But now, you know, of course, they have PID in all, all their high-end machines. And here's, you know, an example of one, $11,000 uh, uh, for a commercial one that has PID in it. So, uh, you know, that's a, that, that could have been an interesting uh, opportunity for a partnership. And I'm just, do I have time to show like a five-minute video or should we call it? Okay, let me, let me just show it for like a minute. Okay. Uh, let me just give you a taste of what, what Maker Faire is like and then uh, we'll call it quits. Uh, this is just a, this is a Maker Faire that we recently had. All right, well, you get the idea. If you want to see the entire video, you can, I'll show it to you on the computer or I'll give you a, a URL where you can see it. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. I really appreciate your attention. So we have, we have some time for a couple of questions. And I, I actually kind of wanted to kick it off. I, I have a question. So it, you mentioned before, whenever a really cool project comes out of the maker or DIY community, it tends to get a lot of media coverage. Mm -hmm. Like blogs pick it up, Boing Boing certainly picks it up, and it, it tends to spread. It finds its way to places like Reddit, even sometimes mainstream media. And from some of the videos you showed, it's clear that there are like regular families doing this kind of stuff. There are like parents and moms and dads and sort of the same kind of people that a lot of, a lot of brands want to market to. Yet you don't see this kind of stuff in any marketing at all. And you don't see many companies collaborating with regular consumers who are hacking their products. I mean, what would you say to like a brand manager who just wants to like reach middle America, but they're, they're doing it in kind of like the traditional way? Like how would you bring someone like that around to get them excited about, about, what, about this entire space? Yeah. Um, I think you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities to, to do things that would be re really fun, like you know, say, say for example, like Pringles. Mm -hmm. What, what can you do with the Pringles can that would be cool? You know, there, uh, you could take it and you could put a, uh, a Wi-Fi antenna in it and then you could have a line of sight Wi-Fi thing so that you could, you know, shoot Wi-Fi across your yard or something like that. Or, or you know, have a contest to, to see what you can do with a product and then have videos of that. That's the kind of thing that, you know, if, if, if done right and, and there's some cool entries, could really go viral with a, a fun video like that. Are there any... Uh you know, I, I went to the Maker Faire in New York, and there were a couple companies there. Is there anything that stands out that a company has, has done in terms of approaching Make or, or a maker within the community to, to do something really cool on a collaborative basis? You know, not yet, which I think is surprising. Uh, and I do think there are a lot of good opportunities out there. Uh, you know, uh, find somebody who's done something cool, who's made something cool, like those Glyph guys, and say, listen, we've got a product. And we would love to have you make something really cool for it. We'll, we'll you know, kick in, you know, we'll do uh, matching funds on Kickstarter for you. Yeah. Something like that. I see we have some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, my name's Elliot Maisie. Um, and I've actually gone to Maker Faire. So uh, I'm somebody who enjoys that world. I want to throw out a question, and it, it, it somewhat relates to both of our presentations here, which is, um, are we also dealing in a defined subculture that wants to be a subculture versus mainstream? So for instance, I didn't hear you mention the largest DIY world, which would be people who go to Home Depot or, or people who go to Walmart and buy stuff and then fix up their houses and stuff. And so almost leveraging off of your question, is there a desire to stay cool and be a subculture and the like, or are we in fact marginalizing the phenomena 
by wanting it to sort of stay, even using the word nerd or geek or, or, or the like. You know, my dad fixed his Ford. You know, he didn't call himself a geek. It was part of Americana that you went out, you went out and you, you fixed your car on the weekends and the like. But now we're defining a lot of stuff, both in terms of even calling it our internet or the internet. Aren't we marginalizing the phenomena? And, and intriguingly, when I go overseas, I don't see that. I don't see that same marginalization of it or that in-group. I see it as a more, the internet there is a more mass, mass media, mass environment, mass accessible. So I just, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a maker. I have a maker bot at home and the like. But I also deeply worry that we are, we're, we're eating our own dog food in a sense and not viewing how do we make these phenomena wider spread. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, I, I share that concern. Um, you know, when you look at the old popular mechanics and popular science from the 1950s, I mean, those things had circulations of like seven million, and uh, they had the same kinds of projects that Make has now, uh, and Make's you know circulation is, is a fraction of that, 100 and you know 35,000 compared to seven million, um, and so I would like to uh, take away that that subculture definition of it. And the hope I see is that every year Maker Faire gets bigger and bigger. About another 20,000 people come every year to the San Mateo one. Uh, you know, the first one was like 20,000. The last one had 85,000 or, uh, you know, 85 to 95,000. And I see tons of families and I see a very broad spectrum of people there. Uh, all ages, you know, uh, uh, both sides of the political spectrum. They're all there because they like the idea of taking a more active role in, uh, in uh, the creation of the things around them. And so, I, I, you know, speaking for Make Magazine, I, I think it is uh, important to, uh, to follow that, uh, that trend and, and take it out of that subgenre, you know, cool geek uh, uh, label because it, it shouldn't have that. It, it's something for everybody. Hi, Mark. Michael Rose. Um, thanks for a fascinating presentation. I, I know Thank a lot you. of us were scribbling URLs down as you went uh, and, and trying to track down these companies uh, and these websites later on because it's great stuff. Thanks. I couldn't help but notice um, as you were talking about the, the Maker Manifesto, the DIY Manifesto and, you know, everything should come with instruction manuals and everything should be user replaceable that at the same time you're presenting from the least user replaceable laptop from <laughs> the least maker-friendly or one of the least maker-friendly companies and in incredibly powerful brands that is out there, but that one that has really pushed the innovation and the development energy very much onto the software side and said, Pretty, leave our hardware alone. How do you feel as someone who's championing the DIY movement and being an Apple user at the same time? Is there any cognitive dissonance there for you? Uh, a little, but, um, you know, I, I'm not an extremist. I like both. And so, you know, I have an Arduino at home to, to make little things. And then I have this, which, you know, I appreciate uh, the design and the, the functionality of it a lot. And I have an iPad. And uh, they, they serve their purpose. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, people just introducing a little bit of DIY into your life, into the, those things that are possible to do, is great. And the people who do want to, like, you know, break DRM or, you know, take this apart and modify it, that is great if, they, if that's their challenge that interests them. But uh, I don't have a, a pro I don't think everything necessarily needs to be open. I think uh, some things uh, that are open present really cool opportunities for, uh, you know, for, for the makers and the manufacturers as well. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, this might be uh, somewhat tangential, but I'm interested in the fact that you raise bees mm -hmm. in a sort of alternative way. And I am wondering if that has something to do with uh, concerns about bees' flight paths. Oh, uh, you, like colony collapse disorder? Yeah. And um, as a tech person, if that relates to like allegations that that has to do with uh, Wi-Fi or cell towers or anything like that. Yeah. Um, 
that's interesting. Um, you know, my house is pretty, has, a, has quite a bit of wireless going on, and the bees seem to be doing fine. I mean, the main reason, back, backwards beekeepers, what we do is instead of buying bees by mail order from, you know, the Midwest and having them shipped to L.A., we take bees that we rescue out of people's chimneys or, you know, or, or inside the walls or something. So we have, like, you know, local native bees who have uh, evolved to exist in, in Los Angeles's Mediterranean climate, and uh, they seem to do better that way. I think colony collapse disorder has a lot of different reasons, not just that, that kind of mold, uh, virus, uh, uh, parasite combo that people say, but there are a lot of things going on, you know, including uh, shipping and, and kind of monoculture. Thanks. <laughs>